ladies and gentlemen. Like most preceding speakers, I would also like to express my fraternal compassion and solidarity with the peoples of Morocco and Libya who have been so hard hit recently by natural disasters with unthinkable consequences. A few weeks ago, I received the report of a mission that I had sent to Libya as part of the African Union Mission of Peace and Reconciliation, which I have headed for almost six years. The report from this mission is a testament to the courage and resilience of the Libyan people who are weary of living divided, a people that is fighting to banish the demons of the country's partition, to return to the path of truth, reconciliation, and peace, a people determined to walk the path of recovery and to regain prosperity. This is a people, a brave and courageous people that have given so much to Africa. It is to them that I express my sincere condolences. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of our general debate clearly reflects our common will to change the world in a qualitative manner. Thus was the noble philosophy and the aim of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the UN 2030 Agenda to ensure peace, security, and prosperity for all the peoples of the world. Whether we're striving to eliminate poverty and hunger in the world thanks to a more just and equitable global economy and thanks to a more efficient and sustainable agriculture or whether we're working to guarantee health for as many as possible and quality education for the most underprivileged. These are all absolute priorities, as are, inter alia, providing water and electricity to as many people as possible, building road, rail, port, airport, and energy infrastructure to link territories, countries, regions, and sub-regions, the conservation of biodiverse ecosystems, especially through responsible management of these tropical forests that are some of the most precious gifts that Providence has bestowed upon us fighting to change mindsets throughout the world while respecting the diversity of cultural expression and while promoting mutual tolerance. Inculcating our societies with the idea of gender equality and gender parity and empowerment of women and girls. With regards to that last point, 
I'd like to underscore the weighty role played by women in my country over the last 15 years. Today, women contribute immensely to promoting their rights and freedoms, to eliminating poverty and expanding inclusive education through training and study of all kinds. To sum up, all of these priorities that I have just listed call upon all of us to have a heightened sense of duty and responsibility, as well as openness toward the virtues of dialogue, a strong spirit of solidarity, patience, and resilience, the well-being of the nations of the world, I believe, hinge largely upon this change and this choice. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, today the climate is the most pressing of all emergencies. This emergency strikes at the heart of life in all of its diversity. It jeopardizes our existence in all of its complexity. The inexorable rise of sea levels that jeopardizes island countries, rampant desertification that nothing seems to be able to stop, suffocating heat waves that take the lives of so many elderly people, frequent flooding and sudden mudslides that cause the damage that we've seen recently. These are all dangerous and devastating phenomena that have shocked even the skeptics among us. And that is why, shouldering my responsibility as president of the Climate Commission of the Congo Basin, I launched during the COP27 in Egypt an initiative called the Global Reforestation Decade for greater biodiversity and for denser vegetation cover for the benefit of humanity. In the same spirit, my country, the Republic of Congo, has committed to hosting in October a summit of three basins of biodiversity ecosystems and tropical forests, namely the Congo and the Amazon, Borneo Mekong, as well as Southeast Asia, as a collective and concerted response of these three green lungs of our planet to climate insecurity which threatens all of us. Since time immemorial, as we all know, forests have made life possible for millions and millions of people. With a deforestation rate that is one of the lowest in the world, just 0.06%, my country is fully playing its part in protecting the environment 
for the survival of humanity. Today, we warmly welcome the inscription of the Odzala Kokua Natural Reserve on the World Heritage List, in the World Heritage List. This took place at the 45th session of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee, which was recently held in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. This is clearly an act of recognition, an act that justly rewards the efforts of my country to preserve this natural treasure of almost 1.2 million hectares, so rich in animal and plant biodiversity in the heart of the Congo Basin. These sacrifices made by riparian communities who have voluntarily given up certain activities that could harm the environment, and the willingness of states to abandon development projects to protect biodiverse ecosystems, these should also be compensated financially by the international community, a compensation that is in no way charity. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, in Africa, with regard to agricultural development, we know that we must protect arable land from the harmful effects of climate change. Otherwise, production estimates would vary widely and planning would become impossible. Our responsibility as leaders is clear as day. With a population of nearly 2 billion in 2050, Africa must now make a qualitative leap to ensure that in the future it has sufficient and high quality food and can thus banish forever the specter of famine and population flight. Africa is in dire need of modern agriculture supported by modern irrigation and mechanization systems. Agriculture that would allow it to greatly reduce its food imports, which are still too high. That is why I'm calling for effective technical and financial partnerships to make great strides in this sector. Africa has no need for partnerships based on official development aid that is politically oriented and tantamount to organized charity. Trickle in subsidies filtered by the selfish interests of donors will certainly not allow for a real and effective rise of our continent. 
Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the current session of the General Assembly is taking place at a time when wars and other armed conflicts are raging throughout the world. Here, I would like to once again underscore that no progress is possible on any continent or any country without peace. The hope of attaining the SDGs laid out by the UN would be merely an illusion if we do not ourselves create the most important of all conditions needed for the realization, that is to say, peace. For its part, and whenever possible, the Republic of Congo has always striven toward the peaceful resolution of conflicts in Africa and throughout the world. That is why my country has decided to take active part in the African Initiative for Peace Mediation between Russia and Ukraine. Due to the risk of generalized war that these events are creating for the world, it is not only the two belligerents in this conflict, but also foreign powers that could nudge the course of events toward peace. All of these actors must temper their emotions, stop fanning the flames, and commit immediately to engaging in peace negotiations that would be just, sincere, and equitable. The world desperately needs these negotiations to prevent the confrontation that's already underway, already so devastating, from further spiraling and pushing humanity into what could be an irreversible cataclysm, that is to say, total war beyond the control of the great powers themselves. I remain convinced that the wise recommendations put forward by Africa to restore peace between Ukraine and Russia will ultimately be heeded. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, as President of the High-Level Committee of the African Union on Libya, I would be remiss not to mention before this august assembly the dire situation that this country has been living in since 2011, a situation in which I am fully invested on behalf of the African Union. Efforts toward peace made in this difficult situation continued recently in July of this year as part of the reconciliation meeting that took place in Brazzaville in my country. This meeting allowed various actors from the entire Libyan political and social spectrum to sit at the same table. We spared no effort to encourage the parties involved to overcome their differences 
and to reconcile their views of the challenges that a future Libya would face. The Inter-Libyan Reconciliation Conference, which I preside, aims at mediation, but it will not be effective unless it is inclusive, constructive, and consensus-based. It must allow our Libyan brothers and sisters to rediscover the virtues of dialogue and to end their standoff, to learn to forgive each other, and to give precedence to justice, the foundation of the law-based state whose history they are called on to write. Once again, I call for the support of the international community, beginning with the countries of the sub-region and the organizations that they belong to, as well as, of course, the countries of the quartet, to provide tangible support for our efforts to create a strong and credible prospect of resolving once and for all this crisis which has gone on far too long. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, in light of the unilateralism that is dangerously eroding the foundations of the great edifice that so many generations have helped to build since 1945, the Republic of Congo, through myself, reaffirms its commitment to multilateralism, the key to justice in international relations, and the key to balance, equity, peace, and cooperation for shared development. Multilateralism, as we all know, can only flourish in a just and equitable global system, a system that reflects not the phantoms of the past, but the changing reality of our time. Whence the urgent need to reform its flagship instrument, that is, the Security Council of the UN, in order to guarantee fairer representation of all continents and all peoples of the world. Here, Africa has a common position, a compromise and consensus-based position signed in Ezzawini, which my country has staunchly defended for more than a decade. Here and now, I reiterate the African demand, legitimate in every way, to see two of its states accorded permanent membership of the Security Council of the UN with veto rights. This would merely be justice in the face of history. Thank you.